Hey, it's Frank. Welcome back to the program. A little delay getting started this week. Jury duty, my periodic responsibility as a citizen. It's always an interesting process. I can't say anything more. I'm obliged to silence about what went on in the jury room. Anyway, jury duty. A little bit of inconvenience, but an interesting civic duty. I think I might be picked for the trial. That's the bummer. In the summer. Anyway, I have a few things in my mind today I want to talk to you about. Some hot topics. Not the stuff, not the hot topics that are on the front page of every news site or on TikTok or Reddit or whatever social media platform you use, Facebook. Just some things that are, I see regularly in the news. I hear from friends, especially on TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook. And I'm talking about the anti-work idea, the anti-capitalist idea. It's, a, it's amongst a certain group of folks, late millennials, Gen Z, and early alphas. And there's a belief out there amongst some of these young folks, but just a small percentage, but not a de minimis percentage, where there's a belief where they shouldn't have to work, that this nine to five thing for 40 plus years of your life is not the way to live, that they should be entitled to a good job, to housing, to food, to vacations, et cetera, et cetera. More sympathetic, I could not be, of course. Work can be a drag, although there's there's tens of millions of people on this planet, probably hundreds of millions of people on this planet that have real passion for the work they do and love their jobs. You know, a little envy for those folks that, that find that niche in their life where they're doing exactly what they like to do, want to do. And that should be everyone's goal, to try to do what you want to do. And, and that, that's understandable. If you're in a job that you don't like or not interested in or is mundane, I can appreciate that. that that's a challenge. If you really don't want to work for someone else, you have the option of working for yourself of using your own innate skills, assets, mental and physical capacity to create your own business. Again, more sympathetic I could, I could not be. And I've been working my whole life. And, you know, it can be it can be a drag, no question. But work, of course, allows us to live. There's something that has to be remembered from an economics perspective about the need to work. Now, we can describe work in a variety of ways. When we think about work today, we think about working for someone else. We think about a corporation or a small business. Or, but of course, when we think of work and we go back tens of thousands of years of human existence, work for most of human existence involved surviving, doing the things you need to do to eat, clothe yourself, and shelter yourself. And those three things, those needs of the human condition are still with us today. And so it boils down to something very simple. If you are not providing for yourself, someone else is. If you're not providing your own food, clothing, and shelter, someone else is. Human beings have a very short gestation period. And when we come out of the womb, we're helpless. And we need our needs provided for, for the first 10, 15 years of our life minimum. Food, clothing, shelter. Forgetting our, our wants, right? We all have unlimited wants. We're just focused on needs. And the needs of food, clothing, shelter. And in that food category, will include water. In our the first parts of our lives, a parent or both parents are providing our needs for us. Some do it really well and some do it really poorly. And of course, some don't do it at all. And those children, those infants need to be you know, taken care of by the government, by local, state or federal government. But otherwise, a parent or ideally two parents take care of your needs for you. If the parents aren't taking care of your needs or some other relative, an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother or grandfather, then it's the government. It's charity. It's some third party. And that means that someone else is working. It means someone else is being productive with their, their mental capacity, their physical capacity to provide a good or service to someone else that they want from which they gain income. And they use an income to donate to a charity or they have taxes taken out of their income to go to government that pays for the needs of those people relying on the government. And let's understand it. There's there's lots of lots of humans that are disadvantaged in life and, and they, they need that safety net to protect themselves. And that's okay. We understand that as a compassionate society. But it's an important thing to remember. If you are not providing for your own needs, someone else is. We can think about that in terms of fairness, selfishness maybe. So when you're a healthy young adult, let's call it 16 or older, and you are reluctant or refusing or unwilling to engage in the productive process that's necessary for you to generate the necessary income to gain access to resources that you need for your food, clothing, and shelter, then you are doing a disservice to yourself and society. You are relying on others to provide for you. 
And I think we need to move away from that mentality. Modern life is tough. More sympathetic, again, as I said earlier, I could not be. Modern life is difficult. Who we get as parents, a roll of the dice, a luck of life. Where we're born, how fortunate are we to be born within the borders of the United States? So there's lots of factors that can disrupt the or make the challenge of life more difficult. But keep in mind, you have the option of working for yourself or working for someone else. And we need to do that in order to provide productive services to gain income, or we can think of income as access to resources, right? Think barter. I exchange my labor, my mental capacity, my physical capacity for a house, for food, for clothing, or I exchange those things by providing a good or service to someone else who finds value in that good or service is willing to pay me money. And from this money, I can generate the things I need in terms of food, clothing, and shelter. It's a very simple concept. It's Economics 101, the first chapter of most economics textbooks. But it's real. There is no getting around it. Without food, clothing, shelter, we die. And if you're not providing it, someone else is. And I promise you, the joy and pride and satisfaction of providing for your own needs is a wonderful thing. And when you get in your late teens, early 20s, and you begin to do that and begin to recognize you're doing it for yourself, it really is a driving force for further success. Not for everybody, mind you. Remember now, this is a 50-minute podcast. That topic I just brought up could be hours of discussion. So no time to go into all the details. The other thing on my mind today is the ongoing, and it really started, I guess, with President Trump becoming a presidential candidate. Fake news, misinformation, disinformation. To read the news today, to manage the news cycle today, requires a sophisticated reader. It requires a certain level of intellect, of compartmentalization, because news today is not what news was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. News today is advocacy, stakeholder journalism. We can very clearly see the ideological framework of a given news organization by reading and watching what they present in the media. We have very obviously left-leaning news. We have very obviously right-leaning news, competing sides. Now, prior to this 20 or 25 years ago, I referenced the media had its bias, no question, but it was more objective. And that bias was more about being America and protecting America. Of course, it was the, lots of at that time was the Cold War. Today, of course, the media landscape is very fragmented. There are millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars being spent on trying to manage public discussion, public rhetoric, the fact-checking world. We have a whole slew of nonprofit organizations out there trying to check the stories. And it really comes down to ideology. And both sides think when the other side claims fake news or disinformation, then that simply means that they don't like that news, that their position is different. And so shut down the other opinion. The idea of censorship is very much thrown around today. I don't like that opinion. That opinion doesn't square with what I think. And so we want to censor that opinion. From both sides, it comes. So here's what you do. How do you manage this? I'm a, new, I'm a news hound. Read, 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 read. Don't forget my mantra. What is my mantra? <laughs> I think I just forgot it. Uh, read, think, write. Read, think, write. I think is my mantra. Something like that. I'll have to practice my mantra. Here's, the, here's what you do. Read as much as you can from all sides. I tell my clients, I tell students, I tell whoever I can, when it comes to reading the news today, in our modern world, in our internet cable-driven world, you must read from all perspectives. Think of the political spectrum. If you sit on the right side of the political spectrum, you must read what the left is talking about. If you sit on the left side of the political spectrum, you must read what the right side is talking about. You can discern what is real news and what isn't real news. And you can do that by reading both sides. The argument could be easily made that one side is less well-informed than the other side simply because of what they don't report, what they don't report, not what they do report. It's a really good way to get around this misinformation, fake news thing. Do your own analysis. You, you do not have to rely on talking heads to make your own decision. Oftentimes, when we talk about differences between political sides in terms of information, disinformation, fake news, it often relates to some public source of economic data or some, some data of any kind. 
And you yourself can go to that data source and look at the information yourself and make your own conclusions. Then when you come back to the internet world or what, however you get your news, if maybe you still use a newspaper, whatever it is, you read all sides. You yourself have looked at the data or the analysis or the study or the report. You read what other people are saying about it. You have your own worldview that you know in your own head. And then you can lean towards where you think it's more likely to be the truth. Some things are still objective out there in the news world. Most things are muddled. Remember, advocacy journalism. And so I encourage you, whenever possible, go to the source that your favorite news reader is, is using or your favorite article or website or whatever it is. Go to the source they're referring to. Do your own analysis and read from Fox News and read from MSNBC. Read from the Washington Post. Read from the Wall Street Journal. It's the best way to get around this problem of misinformation, disinformation, because otherwise it can be very confusing. It's a complex media world out there right now. You have to be a sophisticated reader of the news to make sure you have the truth. That truth is going to go through your own filters, but a great way to manage this problem. We don't need fact checkers. We don't need nonprofit organizations censoring us. We don't need social media telling us what we need to, what we can read and what we can't read. You do that on your own. Free speech. Say what you want to say. I'll discern if you're full of it or not. All right, a couple other things I want to mention. You got to give it to the Biden administration. And Joe Biden's been in office forever, of course. He knows this well. They really focus on the news cycle, don't they? They are very attentive to the news cycle. On Monday of this week, Devin Archer, old buddy of Hunter Biden, testifies behind closed doors to the U.S. Congress about the Biden crime family. And how Joe Biden was very much involved in the bribery world that Hunter Biden lived in. And then yesterday, Tuesday, three new charges from Donald Trump's friend, Jack Smith, the lawyer taken down with the Trump campaign team. Three new charges regarding the 2020 election and what they perceive as President Trump's interference in the peaceful transfer of power. I'm not going to get into the details of this. I'm, you know, I've already said publicly a bunch of times I'm not a fan of President Trump, Donald Trump being the candidate for the GOP. And I think it doesn't matter who the GOP candidate is going to be. Democrats are going to win in 2024. I've said it a few times already. It doesn't matter who the Democrat nominee is. It doesn't matter who the Republican nominee. Democrats win the presidency again in 2024. And I'm not even going to get into the details of the Jack Smith indictment. All I want to say here is this is the Biden administration managing the news cycle. Whenever President Biden and Hunter Biden and corruption are on the front page, something comes out within a day, usually related to Donald Trump, that takes the eyes and ears off that story. Always very interesting. The other thing I want to talk to you about today, Fitch Ratings, one of the rating systems in, in America, think of S&P, also another one, has downgraded the United States of America's long-term foreign currency issue a default rating to AA plus from AAA. Oh, no. This isn't the first time. This happened some years ago. The rating downgrade in the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years of high and growing general government debt burden and the erosion of governments relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades that has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last minute resolutions, says Fitch. That's what you get when you run trillion dollar deficits year after year after year, and they're going to be trillion dollar deficits for the next few years as well. That's what you get when you run $33 trillion in debt. That's when you get that's what you get when national net interest payments, or excuse me, national gross interest payments are approaching $1 trillion on a yearly basis. Now our third or fourth largest government expenditure. And it's right and appropriate. I particularly like this quote from Fitch. In Fitch's view, there has been a steady deterioration in standards of governance over the last 20 years. What they're referring to there is the collapse in the constitutionally required budget process in Washington, D.C. Democrats and Republicans have failed to properly put a budget in place for the last 15 or 20 years and have come down to continuing resolutions just before Christmas every year with a debt ceiling increase because of horrible management of our fiscal policy. And then I find interesting the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's response in that she disagreed with the statement and called it arbitrary and based on outdated data. They're lying out of their teeth when it comes to economics right now. That's all I have for you today. Always try to buy American.